so moving away from the blood brain barrier and more into the realm of something that's a little bit more tangible to most of you um, is the cerebrospinal fluid. This is, this is really one of the beautiful aspects of neuroanatomy. And uh, I don't even know how many medical schools have done away with, <laughs> with gross anatomy classes. And most of those were being transitioned to virtual even before COVID and before the pandemic. Um, so you don't really get that glory even in the gross anatomy lab of, of, of this really amazing interface in the brain and the, and the spinal cord. And the, and the fluid chambers, the ventricles and the subarachnoid space are really quite glorious when you see these for the first time. It's, and I still absolutely love getting a visual on that in the operating room. But the important thing here to understand is that uh, CSF is, is not a static uh, medium. Uh, this is very, very dynamic from the standpoint of something that requires energy at the metabolic level to produce. Uh, and we're not going to spend a lot of time, but I'll show you some, uh, uh, some demonstrations of that. Um, and once produced, and it's a constant, if you will think of it, it's kind of a generator of CSF, which you really can't put on the brakes. Uh, this continues uh, minute after minute uh, with this energy expenditure, goes into the ventricular system and a very, very vibrant circulatory uh, aspect that we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about. You know, why CSF? Uh, and, and this is really quite dramatic. And we tend to think of the metabolic, and I, I mentioned to some degree the physiologic aspects of that, you know, that you can read here. The real function, the real purpose behind cerebral spinal fluid is this here. It has this very important physical function of decreasing the weight of the central nervous system. Uh, some have said it's, it nearly achieves a neutral buoyancy given the fact it's a closed compartment subarachnoid space, the intradural compartment, and full of fluid, your brain and spinal cord essentially float in this media. And it's very easy to understand how very basic physiologic motion to rotation, acceleration, deceleration, you know, otherwise your brain would be resting against the cranial base, uh, be pushing against the sides or frontal and posterior with acceleration, deceleration. Um, so this idea of a constant impact, we see it in athletes all the time, but the reason we don't see this in the normal individual just because of this, this very important uh, role for the CSF, and that's this uh, fact that it's making the brain buoyant. Um, I don't know how many of you have had or uh, seen a lumbar puncture yet, but every time a, a diagnostic spinal tap or lumbar puncture is done, there are certain qualities about this that are extremely important in the di diagnostic realm. Um, and we're going to get into some of those particulars. But this is an example of a needle within the intervertebral or interlaminar space going into the fecal tube. Uh, it's always described as looking like water. That's the normal uh, de design or, or the, the structure and color of CSF, the transparency. Um, there should be a paucity of cells in this. So those two issues, the color, the cellular makeup of this becomes extremely important in the diagnostic realm, as does the glucose and protein. Um, not a lot of CSF, you know, if you think of the entire cranial and spinal compartment, that's not a lot of fluid at 100 and plus cc's, 140 cc's. Um, and, you know, one of the pimp questions we always uh, throw out at our medical students or residents is, you know, what is the biggest domain of CSF in the central nervous system? And it's not the intraventricular compartment, it's that subarachnoid space that everything floats in. So it's really a, a minority, about a third of the CSF is actually within the ventricular compartment, even though that's what we see macroscopically on imaging. A couple important points uh, that, that have relevance clinically, um, really the, the two biggest ones are osmolality and, and sodium. Uh, you see these other electrolytes in various um, relative proportions compared with plasma. And, you know, I think if you look at this far right column here, that's kind of the, the important aspect. So when CSF is being drawn out of the body, and we do this a lot from the standpoint of treatment of hydrocephalus, we're going to talk about that, uh, externalized drains, shunts, there's this constant efflux of sodium coming out of the central nervous system. Um, so one needs to pay attention to that, and we'll see this in the very, very young children. Uh, Dr. Greenfield has a patient on our service right now in the neonatal unit who's been getting serial taps. And one of the questions I always ask the residents every time they do a tap is what was the sodium afterwards? So you, you can proportionally decrease the plasma electrolytes uh, based on the concentration or relative higher concentration in the CSF. Um, and again, from a diagnostic standpoint, that becomes important. You know, the other clinical relevance, which you'll hear a lot, you don't have to go into neurosurgery to see this, is individuals that have a suspicion for CSF leak or egress. You see this in trauma, 
spontaneous uh, dehiscence of the cranial base, where CSF is leaking out of the ear, the nose, called otorrhea or rhinorrhea, respectively. Sometimes it's hard to make that diagnosis, especially through the nose, is it normal secretions or not. Um, and fortunately, there are ways to make this diagnosis based on the type of protein you'll find in the CSF, and that which is diagnostic is called beta-2 transferrin or tau protein. And this you can actually send for electrophoresis, as you see indicated here, uh, which should not be a, 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 in existence in any other body system or liquid uh, component of the body. So it becomes extremely powerful from a diagnostic standpoint when one is trying to make that determination. Um, and that's called beta-2 transferrin. It really, the, the crux of this talk and certainly the applied aspect of the neurosurgeon we'll get into here, and that is the production, the circulation, and the resorptive capacity of the central nervous system. Um, what becomes very telling is if you start to think of the CSF chambers very much like you think of your bloodstream or your lymphatics, and that is there is production. It's a very dynamic uh, process. Uh, there is circulation and there's absor absorptive capacity. So it, it is a real form of circulation in every measure. Uh, the, these numbers here become highly important when you start thinking about the, uh, the rapidity of which something can go wrong when something's thrown out of balance. Um, depicted here in the number of cc's per hour. Uh, turning back the clock when I was a resident, I used to talk about, you know, about a Dixie cup an hour. I don't think anybody knows what Dixie cups are. Maybe shot classes <laughs> for you in the audience. Um, so about that on, a, on an hourly basis, and you can see what that translates to a day. So every day, your CSF, the entire thing from ventricles to subarachnoid space, are going to turn over, you know, a number of times, four to five times a day. And that most likely has a lot of preservative uh, elements to it with regard to preservation of cellular function as well. And over the lifetime, this is an amazing, uh, if you will, wash of, of the central nervous system uh, that happens uh, continuously. Um, the, I, I promise I'd say something about the aspect of this uh, blood-brain barrier. If this is a ventricular compartment, the epithelium of the choroid plexus, which is the main generator, we're going to talk about that of CSF, and here's your capillary endothelium. So again, not fenestrated, tight junctions here on the ad luminal side. Uh, so to get fluid, uh, namely CSF, from the serum through the choroidal epithelium and into the chambers of the ventricle or subarachnoid space, it's this energy expenditure from the standpoint of sodium, potassium, or, uh, sodium, uh, uh, potassium pumps, bicarbonate pumps. And this requires a glucose uh, machinery to get this. This is really important from the standpoint of the uh, the electrolyte balance and driving not just at the capillary level but at the neuronal level the balance of neurotransmitters and and how uh, uh, potentials are transmitted from one cell to another it's an extremely tightly regulated system um, and certainly many pathologies disrupt that um, so this this migration of, of water really is is or free water is one of uh, a huge amount of uh, glucose metabolism um, I mentioned that this constant rate of production, of course, there are non-physiologic places uh, where that might get interrupted. Um, you know, you, th there's a lot written on this uh, topic, but I think the important things to focus on here, and, uh, and I'll highlight those, you know, rarely do we ever see increased production. So when you start thinking about hydrocephalus, it's usually almost universally a problem with absorptive or circulatory processes, with one rare exception, and that's any type of hypertrophic process of the choroid plexus, be they tumors, benign or malignant, or another entity called choroid plexus hypertrophy. And it makes sense that if you have more of that interface of CSF production, it's going to result in higher rates of CSF production. And that's the one clinical scenario where you may see this, uh, even though they are rare. Um, people ask a lot, you know, can you shut off uh, CSF production when the ICP goes up? Wouldn't that be nice if somebody with major head trauma doesn't have a problem with ICP because they shut off their uh, hydro under uh, CSF production? It doesn't happen. This, this continues uh, into the latest stages of raised ICP. Um, and likewise, with age, really past very young infancy, it, it's not altered as far as that 20 to 30 cc's an hour. So. You know, the, the decreased element of this really is not so much one of the pathology as much as can we actively decrease CSF in an attempt to treat some of these issues. 
it's very, very, very rare that you can have any type of manipulation of CSF production. Uh, I think I may have on the subsequent slide uh, some ability to do this. And we'll use this in a temporizing fashion. I talked about uh, the bicarbonate balance across the, the cell membrane at the choroid plexus epithelium. If you can alter that, um, that uh, production of protons and uh, carb carbonic uh, acid, you can actually influence the production of fluid because it won't migrate through that cell based on the electrolyte imbalance that you want to impose. So this idea of uh, 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 limiting this reaction uh, with acetazolamide is real. Um, and this is the only pharmacologic manipulation that's actively used on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't shut it off. Uh, we'll use it as temporizing maneuvers. Somebody's waiting for surgery, someone's being transported, we're waiting for some reversible process to take hold. It's a very effective means for a decrease in CSF um, uh, production. Uh, long term, it becomes very problem from the standpoint of uh, metabolic acidosis, and this is not uncommon uh, that uh, you will see if used chronically, but a very effective and powerful agent. You know, very common drugs you see, but from the standpoint of uh, utility in the, in the clinical space, you know, it doesn't happen. Uh, you'll see this periodically from the standpoint of some pathology, but usually not recognized in CSF imbalance, but more in sodium uh, imbalance. Uh, aquaporins are real big right now in the biochemical world and CSF physiology aspects. There's a number of these uh, uh, transmembrane water channels, which are getting a lot of attention now from the standpoint of potential pharmacologic uh, uh, interface. Uh, so it's an exciting field, especially from the standpoint of individuals who are thinking of targeting these from the standpoint of another uh, less uh, 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 I should say less invasive method of treating CSF production or even hydrocephalus by, by manipulating these, these aquaporins. So that's an exciting area if someone's interested in the, uh, the real metabolic basis of uh, control of CSF production. Um, you know, th this, this comes up a lot. Um, you know, what is the generator? Where is CSF produced? Uh, you can think of it for all intents and purposes that the choroid plexus, we're gonna get into that in a little more detail, is the main generator of this. Uh, we know very well that CSF can continue to be produced in the absence, uh, global absence of uh, choroid plexus. Again, we'll talk about this as an applied way. And some transcellular membrane production of CSF through the ependymal layer no doubt happens, usually under a compensatory process where you get a dramatically raised intraventricular pressure. And we'll talk about that as a compensation. The choroid plexus is a, another wonderful <laughs> visual you get with neuroendoscopy or, or operating on the ventricular system, which we commonly do in children. Uh, it's just a wonderful, uh, frothy looking, soft, beautiful material that, that tends to float and ebb and flow in the CSF in a, in a glorious way. Um, this is it on, a, uh, on, a, on an H&E stain and an EM. Uh, and this is, you, know, you look at this and you get a great sense of the fragility of this. These are cells thick, you know, one layer thick along the choroidal epithelium with the uh, capillary endothelium on the inside of this. So it doesn't take much to damage it, you know, and I, we talked about the physiologic aspects of this, but, you know, very, very fragile membrane that is easily injured. It's quite large, you know, and uh, again, like the intestinal lumen, if you stretch this out over its, uh, you know, monolayer of cells, you know, it's huge relative to the ventricular compartment. Um, we, we talked about the, the, the vascular endothelium versus uh, what we see in the brain parenchyma where it's widely fenestrated. Um, the autonomic innervation, uh, you don't see anything from the clinical basis that is uh, necessarily relevant. Here's another in H and E, single cell layer, you know, filled by capillary endothelium, red blood cells in here. This is the, the view you'd get, typical view from an endoscopic approach toward the frame of Monroe with this uh, very, very fragile, frothy material that in videos, if, if these play, you'll see it kind of uh, wash back and forth. Um, the, the other important thing and depicted here, once again, the capillary endothelium uh, transgresses from the parenchymal compartment into the choroid plexus. Here you get those tight junctions at the apex. Um, the epithelium of the, uh, the endothelium of the capillary fenestrated. So it allows that uh, production of CSF to go unencumbered, providing the, the metabolic aspects of those cells are intact. 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.